Greetings, History of Economic Thought to Hillsdale College. And today we're going to start our series on macroeconomics, the history of macroeconomics. And uh, you might wonder, hmm, macroeconomics, well, what is it? Macroeconomics is the study of the economy as a whole. And uh, that immediately makes us wonder, well, hasn't it always been, been something like that? Go back to Adam Smith talking about the wealth of nations. He's talking about the economy as a whole. Uh, what about the Walrasian school? The Walrasians, of course, try to talk about all the connections across all the markets in an economy uh, with general equilibrium theory. Um, why isn't, isn't macro just what Smith and the classicals were doing? Well, we're going to talk about modern macro. Modern macroeconomics is really a focus on aggregates, on the idea that we've added up, in some sense, all of, the, uh, all of the statistics or the basics of the economy, trying to look at them as a whole. So we think about things like the price level, the rate of growth, total GDP, things like this. And there are a couple of fundamental questions or issues that come up in macroeconomics. And typically those are considered to be story of the business cycle, the ups and downs of the economy, and then second, the long run picture, which is the picture of economic growth. We hope it's growth. Um, we could also perhaps add to that money, monetary economics. Uh, the, the great Chicago economist, Milton Friedman, actually argued that he didn't understand why we call it micro and macro. He said it should be price theory and monetary theory. He preferred that distinction. But we're going to talk about uh, I talk about these things. On, as an aside on that, the Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises argued that money is just another good, and it really fits into the whole idea of price theory. But we're going to tackle these ideas, and we're going to do it in four short lectures, and these are going to cover the development of modern macroeconomics. We're going to start with the Austrians, and from the Austrians we'll move to the Keynesians, uh, John Maynard Keynes and the Keynesian view of the business cycle, all of that's focused on business cycle. Uh, we'll then move to monetarism, Milton Friedman's critique of Keynesianism and his emphasis on the importance of money, and then the rational expectations revolution. So that's our little guide, a little outline for where we're going to be going with this. We're not going to focus so much on economic growth. We will save that for a later, later discussion. So what is the story then of, uh, of what we're going to talk about, this modern, modern macro? I'm going to start out with the Austrians. I'm going to pick uh, Ludwig von Mises. And so we'll get that going here, the Austrian school. And in particular, we want to talk about the Austrian business cycle theory. Austrian business cycle theory, which I will abbreviate occasionally ABCT, and it's first developed really by, formally developed, by Ludwig von Mises. And Mises, of course, as we know, was an, was an Austrian economist, um, a student of uh, Eugen von Bawerk, follower of Menger, and his first important work was in 1912, he published The Theory of Money and Credit. <coughs> Theory of Money and credit published in German, and that's of course by Ludwig von Mises. Mises, uh, to remind you, lived 1881 to 1973. Um, this is the first, probably we could say, the first truly modern treatment of money. It's still worth reading. I think it's underappreciated. Uh, Robert Mundell, Nobel Prize winner for his work in monetary economics, has actually said that. Uh, that it's underappreciated and needs more attention. Um, but he develops this story. It's a microeconomic treatment of money and of prices. And what Mises does in this book is bring money under the heading of the new marginal utility theory. Marginal utility, subjective marginal utility being a, a relatively new invention at the time. In some respects, it's a response to the German historical school uh, the, char the, the, the theory of chartalism, which was developed by Georg uh, Knopp. Uh, Knopp was argued that money was an invention of the state. 
and it was for purposes of taxation if the state bestows money on society. Knopf's argument was a response to Carl Menger. Carl Menger, one of Mises' uh, teachers in a sense, Menger had argued that money is, a, is something that comes up spontaneously. It originates in the market. And so Mises actually perfects the theory that was developed by Menger. <clears throat> well, um, you've probably come across, you certainly come across this. We've covered it earlier a little bit in our discussion of the Austrian school. And you've come across it in, in some of your, uh, some of your uh, macroeconomics courses. Um, but this, this really is a, when Mises develops his theory of money, he also develops in it a theory of the business cycle. He actually gets this from going back and looking at the old debates in England, debates uh, between the currency school and the banking school. If you remember from our History of Thought course one, in, in HET one, we talked about Henry Thornton. Thornton laid out a theory of how the, equa how the, uh, how the quantity theory of money works and what's the underlying activity, the underlying macro, macro, or microeconomics and transmission mechanisms that lead to the relationship between a change in the money supply and a change in prices. Well, Mises builds on that. That, that carries over into the banking school, currency school. Mises builds on that and realizes that, he argues that the natural, there's a natural rate of interest and that will reflect the time preference that people have and their willingness to wait for goods. And if people's time preference changes, if it decreases, their, in, their willingness to wait increases, they will save more and invest. Interest rates will fall and that will mean we'll have longer term capital structures or there were riskier capital structures, but there'll be an increase in the investment. And that's a fine thing. That represents a change in underlying factors. So the argument here is one of a loanable funds kind of theory of interest. And the notion here is that with this theory that time preferences lead to a willingness to save, which is then translated into interest rates. And I should emphasize those are market rates of interest. And that then into borrowing and investment. And so this is the chain. <clears throat> Great. Well, uh, that's great. That, that shows that just as the prices of goods, just as the prices of goods lead to the amounts of uh, stuff that is put into the market, but those depend upon people's preferences, so too this temporal structure and risk structure of the economy depend again on people's willingness to wait. But then Mises says, okay, but how does the business cycle come out of that? Suppose that the monetary authority uh, changes, artificially lowers the interest rate. Because notice if people's time preferences change, so they're more willing to wait, they will increase their saving, interest rates will fall, and that will lead to more investment. But what happens if, uh, say, private banks extend too much credit? Mises raises this question. He later doubts that that's going to be the thing that drives the business cycle, but in his 1912 book, he says that it's a, it's a possibility. Uh, as an aside, he doubts that it would be a, a major driver of the business cycle because he argues there would be a, the reflux mechanism that would cut it short if we have a free banking system. Uh, that if a bank issued too much credit, it would, there would be a run on that bank which would shut it down. Suppose it's a different kind of monetary authority. Suppose it's a government central bank, much less likely to have a run on a central bank. And uh, it pursues an easy money or easy credit policy well, you don't get the change in time preference or the change in the willingness to save, but you do get the change in the market rate of interest, that signal. And that leads to a change in investment. But, says Mises, that change does not represent underlying changes of preferences and behavior. And so those, those things become misaligned. And that's what Mises calls an artificial expansion 
interest rate falls because of the new credits, it's a false signal of an increased willingness to wait. And entrepreneurs now are involved in, get involved in new, longer term and riskier projects. They'll begin bidding up the prices of inputs and they will de-emphasize consumer goods as they move into these longer term production processes. And so pre consumer good prices start going up and it starts to look like all prices are going up as a result. It looks like an increase in demand. There are also what, what we call cantillon effects, injection effects, the money's not neutral, so it's shifting the kinds of things that are being purchased in the economy. Great. <clears throat> well, eventually that could lead, since we're increasing the money supply here, that could lead to a general, would lead to a general inflation. And while initially entrepreneurs see that as an increase in demand, and so they're encouraged to expand, they begin to at some point realize that maybe Maybe that's not the case. Um, eventually, the monetary authority will slow the growth and an equilibrium is reestablished and that means a recession. There's a drop as mistaken investments are liquidated. We can show this graphically. We shall do so. <clears throat> Let's begin with the story of time preference is changing and the willingness to save changing. So on this axis, we will put an interest rate. And on this axis, a quantity of funds available for, to be loaned out. And we'll call this the loanable funds market. <clears throat> and uh, the uh, first thing we'll do is start with an equilibrium position. And there's a demand curve. There's a supply curve for funds. And great, there is an equilibrium natural rate of interest. The term actually, I believe, comes from Newt Wicksell. It's one that reflects, this interest rate reflects people's willingness to behave in the market, their willingness to save in the market. Great, so we're at equilibrium. But then one day, people's uh, time preferences change. They're increasingly willing to wait and therefore, they increase their amount of saving. That is, wait, they postpone or delay consumption. So move from S0 to S1, and what happens is we have a new equilibrium established, a new rate, and we've moved up here. There are more funds available on the market, and that should change the amount of investment going on in the market. Oh, great, there's more capital, more saving. Uh, that chain right here. And we might expect very simply that moving over time, what happens is the economy was going along with this level of output. And then what happens? We make this shift. And so there's more capital and we shift to a higher level of output. Something like that, we could think. That's roughly what's going on. More saving, more capital, more growth, more income. OK. But suppose instead this shift was not a change in time preferences or willingness to save, so we'll move that out, but rather it was a central bank simply expanding liquidity in some way. A uh, central bank extends new credits. Um, great. Well, what happens then is we get this same shift and we get this drop here, but it's no longer, I'll take the natural rate out, it's no longer accurately reflecting people's time preferences. So Mises argues that what will actually happen is there will be the boom here as before, but consumers did not cut back on consumption. And the competition for resources will begin driving up prices. There's more money being pumped into this economy or more credit. And the sectors that receive the funds first will expand relative to the others. Again, Cantillon talked about that uh, back in the uh, early 1700s. <clears throat> well, there's competition for resources that generates price inflation. That's Henry Thornton. And so prices are going up. Uh, we see a shift into things like stocks and housing and things that, that would tend to benefit from the lower interest rates. 
And at some point, the monetary authority decides to tighten this down to stop the money creation, to stop the inflation. And so the old, re old equilibrium and a, re a new equilibrium asserts itself. Might not be the same one because resources have changed hands. Uh, and there's a crash of some sort. Product projects that were dependent upon low rates of interest suddenly become no longer cost effective. And we have to liquidate mistakes. There are falls in prices and things like that. And so we get the bust. Something like this. Great. The boom bust cycle. And that's a very simple story of how the uh, Austrian business cycle uh, might work. <clears throat> Well, this theory is developed by, by Mises, and then it is expanded, expanded upon by Friedrich Hayek. Uh, Hayek uh, Mises and Hayek established the Austrian, uh, the Austrian School for the Austrian Center for the Study of Business Cycles in Vienna right around 1920, about the same time that he writes his, his, his critique of socialism, and they begin developing this, this work. Uh, this catches on. When the Great Depression hits, Lionel Robbins is one of the promoters of this as an explanation of the Great Depression. Uh, similarly, Austrians such as Gottfried Haberler and Fritz Machlup promote this. And the theory is, is at the time of the Great Depression, when it first, first occurs, this is the predominant, among economists, the predominant theory of what's going on. Um, and of course, as you know, that changes. It changes in 1936 with the publication of John Maynard Keynes' General Theory. Uh, but we will, we will save that for the moment. Um, there are interesting arguments about how this might be applied to today, and there have been attempts to develop this, this theory further. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, to me, it's, it seems like a very good start on a theory. I'll say just a couple of things about it. Maybe, maybe a few critiques. And one is that it's, it's, it's a theory that focuses on, on the microeconomics. So it's not, in some sense, not truly a macroeconomic theory. Um, it talks about why a number of entrepreneurs would make the same kind of mistake at the same time. Uh, why would we see a wave of business failures or business errors instead of just, just some uh, you know, something that's constant. Why do we see, why do we see uh, a number of them at the same time? Um, and it has to do with this kind of an inter intervention of the false signal. Um, later economists, and we'll talk about this a bit, such as Robert Lucas, build on this theory in some sense. Uh, Lucas refers to this inability to tell the difference between, is this an increase in demand for my good, or is it general increase in prices. He calls that a signal extraction problem. Uh, the entrepreneur sees prices going up, but does that constitute real demand for his product or her product? Or does it constitute, is it a signal of general rate of inflation? And that's a tough thing to decipher. They can't really do that. Signal extraction problem. Um, there are other kinds of ideas here that we'll see will come up in when we study the, uh, when we get to the rational expectations revolution. Um, Lucas actually calls Mises' evenly rotating economy uh, story. He calls that a prototypical or a very early, um, early prototype of the rational expectations equilibrium. And a shock to that system is what Mises is talking about. There is something a little fishy about this for an Austrian because it is an equilibrium, uh, an equilibrium theory. Uh, Israel Kirzner has argued that one's credentials as an Austrian don't depend upon accepting this as being the cause of all, of, of all, uh, all uh, business, business cycles. Um, because it is a little bit, even, even Mises observed that it's an equilibrium theory and that's a little bit, a little bit odd. Um, a couple of other questions that might be raised about this theory. The tendency in business cycle, empirically, the tendency in a business cycle in a crash during the bust, the booms tend to occur especially in real estate. 
And that's not accounted for in this theory, which really talks more about long-term projects like investing in factories and things like this. Uh, it could certainly be tweaked to focus on real estate, but there seem to be certain sectors where that focus, uh, focus appears, um, which aren't accounted for in the theory. The theory also says nothing about lower interest rates generating more consumer, consumer expen expenditure. And yet a great deal of borrowing today is focused on consumer markets. Uh, so the, the theory I often say is, is half-baked, but since all other business cycle theories strike me as being not even half-baked, it's still a nice start. Um, what sh else shall we say about it? Uh, that's probably enough right now. The interesting thing about this is that this theory uh, is displaced, almost entirely discredited, by late 1930s. The only people endorsing it by the late 1930s appear to be Ludwig von Mises, Friedrich Hayek, and Ludwig Lachmann. And the rest of the Austrians, including Lionel Robin, Robbins, Haberler, and uh, Machlup, have rejected it and said, we were mistaken. We think Keynes is right. That will be the next part of our story.